Hello and welcome back to the Sports Biomechanics Lecture Series. As always, supported by the International Society of Biomechanics and Sports and sponsored by Vicon. Now, hopefully over the past couple of weeks, you've managed to enjoy some of the ISBS conference presentations. And if you haven't, then these are still available on YouTube over at the ISBS um, channel. So do go and check those out. But for now, I guess following on from a couple of excellent talks that we've already had in this series relating to athletics, so both long jump with a sports prosthesis and uh, running footwear and the two-hour marathon, we've got another talk relating to athletics, this time by Dr. Sam Allen, who is a senior lecturer at Loughborough University. And Sam was also one of my PhD supervisors. So it's been really nice for me to get Sam involved in this and Game to talk to everybody today. And I think it's a topic of simulating the triple jump that hopefully has quite a wide appeal. So it's really interesting, or at least in my opinion, from a theoretical biomechanics perspective, but also has some real interest and practical applications from a sporting performance perspective, and even through to a strength and conditioning perspective of how to work with athletes and get a transference. Um, through to improvements in their actual performance. So yeah, hopefully another really interesting talk. Um, it is pre-recorded, so if anybody has any questions for Sam, then either drop a comment down below on YouTube and we'll try and get an answer for you. Or I think at the end of the talk, Sam does have his email address on there and he said he's happy for people to email him. So hope you enjoy. Okay, uh, firstly, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much to, to Stuart for the invitation to to do this lecture um, and, and thank you for his efforts in putting together this lecture series. He's, he's got uh, a great group of speakers and, and I'm really honoured to, um, to be invited to join them. So what I'd like to, to, to talk about today really is work that began with my, my PhD, which was published more than 10 years ago now in computer simulation of, of the triple jump. So I'm just gonna go through the evolution of the work from, from the, the, the very first studies, studies I did with my PhD uh, through to the most recent ones. Um, the first thing I'll do is just to give you a, a quick recap of, of what the triple jump is. Uh, most people will know obviously, but, but just uh, to remind you of the specifics. And then I'm just gonna go through three uh, three studies really that that, that we did uh, myself and my my co-authors Mark King and, and Fred Eden and and they relate to the arm technique in triple jumping uh, double versus single arm technique and then velocity trade-offs during the the ground contacts and and lastly the effects of altering strength and, and approach velocity on performance um, the latter two, horizontal to vertical velocity trade-offs and, and strength and approach velocity, relate to the phase ratio, and I'll come on to what that, that means uh, specifically in a minute. And then lastly, we can draw some conclusions from, from all this work. So the triple jump. Um, it's uh, an athletic event, a track and field event, which comprises an approach run where um, athletes sit try to generate um, pretty much maximum velocity, almost maximum velocity, uh, followed by three consecutive phases. And they are the hop, which taking off from a, a takeoff board from one leg onto the same leg, followed by a step where they go from that, that same leg onto the other leg and a jump, which ends up in the sand pit. And the performance is the distance from um, the front of the takeoff board to the rearmost mark they make in the sand. So they're trying to maximize that distance. So the motivation really for, for why uh, we wanted to simulate this was that triple jumping is potentially one of the most, if not the most, physically demanding disciplines in sport. Um, The ground reaction forces have been measured up to 22 body weights, which is enormous. And I think James Hay said that was the highest 
uh, force going through a human limb that had been measured in any volitional activity. So in that respect, it's potentially the most physically demanding discipline in sport. Also, there's a control aspect with three phases uh, put together, which makes it interesting to, to simulate and how these phases have to have to be balanced in order to, to, to maximize the performance. Um, there were lots of really good experimental studies on the triple jump, and they were uh, a lot of those were in the 90s by by James Hay and, and, and Bing Yu, and they provided lots of really good information on, on techniques used by the very best athletes in the world. Um, so the motivation really to simulate this activity was to, to maybe add a little bit of insight into why the athletes use these techniques, why, why were they optimal, um, and then possibly how might they manipulate them to, to improve performance further. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the arm technique, and, and I'll show you a video, a couple of videos of, of these different arm techniques in a second. So I'm going to try to stay fairly, fairly surface level. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the, the methods of simulation, uh, but if you need to know that, if you want to know that, I'll put the, the links up here to the papers uh, where you can go and find out the specific details. So I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Mark King and, and Fred Yeadon, uh, who were also my PhD supervisors. Um, and they, they were my co-authors in, in, in all the papers I'm going to, to talk about today. So there are two techniques in triple jumping. This is an example of the first one where the arms move asymmetrically back and forth through the phases. So it's a bit like running. I'll just play that again. So the arms move back and forth in opposition to the legs, and he does actually bring them together. This is Jonathan Edwards, still the current world record holder, jumping 17 metres and 80 something in Atlanta uh, in 1996. Now the other technique is the double arm technique where athletes bring the arms uh, symmetrically back and forth um, with each phase. So this, is an example of the double arm technique. This is Christian Taylor, probably the, the best, um, well, certainly the best male, tri male triple jumper and of, of recent years. And this is him getting very close to Jonathan Edwards' world record uh, of 1829. I think this was about 1820, 21. So watch his arms. They move back and forth with each face. So he, he actually gathers them behind him before takeoff and then brings them back and forth. There's Jonathan Edwards sweating uh, on his world record there in the commentary box. So I'll just play that again. So you'll see he gathers his arms behind him at touchdown of the, uh, of the takeoff step. And he brings them back and forwards and back and forwards with each ground contact. So two techniques. Um, and the aim of this study really was to determine which one's the best. So the first thing uh, I had to do was to construct a, a model of triple jumping. So the way the models work, uh, they are representations of, of the body. So in this case, the model has 13 rigid segments representing the limbs. Um, they're completely rigid, that, that there's no compression at all within the segment or between the segments that are pin linked. Um, and then on top of this, we have wobbling masses. Now wobbling masses just represent the, the soft tissue motion. So they are allowed to move. They themselves are rigid segments, but they can move relative to the skeleton, the, uh, the skeleton that we just saw. And they represent the movement of the wobbling mass. So the muscles and, and the fat and the viscera and all those kind of things, which is important, especially during impacts, and there's no higher impact than, than during a triple jump. So it's very important to include that. Now the model, this model is driven by torque. So it's a torque generator model. Uh, all the white dots here on this picture represent um, a torque generator. So the MCP, ankle, knee, hip, and shoulders were all torque generated. Um, torque actuated and the elbow was actually L, uh, angle driven so that, that was taken from measured performance which I'll come on to in a minute. 
And the interaction with the ground is by a set of springs. So that just uh, represents uh, a force which the size of which is determined by the uh, the intrusion of the of the foot into the ground. So that's the structure of the model. Oh, just a quick uh, comment on the reasons for the wobbling masses. So here's a jump takeoff. Um, and if you watch, you can see that the soft tissue moves substantially on impact. And, that, and that's what we include the wobbling masses in the, in the model for, to represent that, uh, that motion. So effectively, it means that the, the mass of the body is allowed to continue to, to move forwards and downwards on impact for a little bit longer than it would if we didn't include wobbling masses and that, and that attenuates the impact. So if we look at the soft tissue, you can see it moves around a lot. So there's quite significant movement of the soft tissue over the, over the skeleton. So the, the inputs and outputs to the model are the kinematics um, at touchdown. So that's the way the model is moving. And we only simulated the ground contact phases and we estimated the, the movement in the air from, from measured data. So we, we used the angular momentum changes throughout the airborne phases to, to put the model in the right place for landing, if you like. So we give it the kinematics of the way it's moving. And then the thing that moves the models uh, is the activation timings of the, of the torque generators. So the torque generators can switch on and off effectively like the muscles, um, and they can extend and, and flex the joints at different times in order to either match the performance or to maximize, maximize the performance. And then the outputs of the models are the kinematics and kinetics throughout each of the ground contacts. So we get all the, all the joint motions and the ground contact forces, um, joint um, moments, etc. And that's the case for each of the three phases of, of the triple jump. This is just an example of what, what I mean by the activation. So the activations are actually defined by activation profiles. So there are various different, or there are four different types. Um, so representing different uh, muscle groups, if you like. So they can ramp up, so they can be inactive, and they can ramp up to being active or they can ramp down, i.e. they're active and they ramp down to not being active, or they can ramp up and down, or down and up, uh, depending on the, on, on the requisite actions at that joint. So the first thing we needed to do was to get some uh, representative data of a triple jumper, um, because what we wanted to do was to make the, the model subject specific, that's specific to a particular athlete. And the way we did that was to measure uh, a triple jump performance um, and to measure various aspects of the triple jumper himself. So how strong was he uh, based on measurements from a, an ISO velocity dynamometer and how long and heavy were his body segments. And we did that using um, anthropometric measurements and, and Eden's geometric model to, to calculate the segmental inertia parameters of the uh, of, of each of the segments in the model. So the data collection, oh, the talk data collection uh, resulted in surfaces like these. So what we did was to collect talk data at a range of angles and angular velocities for each of the talk driven joints in the model. Um, and then we fit a surface to that data uh, in order to, to specify at any given angle and any given angular velocity, what the maximum joint torque um, achievable by the subject was. So we, we did that for each of the torque driven, driven joints. And then this is the data collection of the triple jump. So we actually took force data, there's a force platform located uh, just before the pit here. So we took force data of each of the phases of the triple jump. So we asked to get representative data. We asked the, the jumper to do the takeoff of each phase from the force plate. So we had the, the hop takeoff, uh, the step takeoff, 
and, and the jump takeoff. And that gave us representative uh, force data for each of the phases. So from that, we, we got um, the joint kinematics from the Vicon data, and that allowed us to use these both as an input to the simulation model and also to evaluate the simulation model, which I'll, I'll come on to in just a second. So it was quite a challenge, actually. Uh, this is quite a while ago now. Um, it was quite a challenge, actually, to, to fit such a big volume into the into the Vicon capture. Um, it was around 18 meters, so we, we really did struggle to calibrate su such a huge volume, just about managed it in the end by putting the calibration wand on the end of a, a pole vault pole. So, as I mentioned, the first thing in, in any modeling process, really, um, is to evaluate the model. So we want to establish whether the model is capable of reproducing the performance. So in this case, the, the computer uses an algorithm, in this case, a, a genetic algorithm, to vary the torque generator activation times in order to minimize the difference between the recorded performance and the simulation. So that's the performance at the top. This is measured uh, from Vicon, and this is the simulation model here at the bottom. And it tries to minimize an objective function which represents things like the differences in um, joint angle time histories, uh, ground contact times, velocity at takeoff, angular momentum, that kind of thing. And an overall score is then achieved to establish whether it can match. So in this case, it, it matches quite well and results in a score of um, just over 2%, I think. And you can see that, that visually they look, they look quite similar. Oh. I'll just see if I can play that again. Skipped a little bit. No, it's doing it again. So you can see that it, it results in a, in a pretty similar movement. So we were confident that the model was capable of reproducing the performance that, that was actually achieved. And so from there, we felt we could go on to optimize the, the model. And this is a real strength of computer simulation in that you can then ask the algorithm, if you like, to vary those input parameters in order to try to maximize performance this time rather than the match performance. So this allowed us then to answer our, our research question, which was um, which is the optimal arm technique. So we'll see in the matched simulation at the top here, uh, just look what the arms do in relation to the one at the bottom and, and, the, and the legs, in fact, the swinging legs. So in this case, here's the match simulation. This is the optimized simulation. So the, the objective function was the distance jumped um, by the model. So that's the, the, the cumulative uh, distance of each of the three phases. So if we just run this through, you should be able to see that the techniques are quite different between the matched and the optimized simulation. Okay, so that resulted in, in quite a significant improvement on the measured performance, which was uh, the match performance, which was um, 1267, and it resulted in, in over a meter's improvement on that. So a significant improvement on the, on the performance on the day. I think I've got a video coming up here. So this is just a comparison of the two techniques. This is an example um, of the differences between the, the, the match performance and, and the one that the, the algorithm found. Uh, to maximize performance. So the key thing here is to look at the differences in the in the swinging limbs really, specifically the the arms which are very different but also the the swinging leg as well. So we can see that 
where the match performance and the and the, the experimental data represented a single arm technique where the, the arms were moved asymmetrically, the algorithm found that actually a double arm technique, so bringing the arms forwards together um, at the same time, was optimal. And also, it seems to have increased the uh, the, the flexion of the, of the free limb as well. So trying to get that mass as, as far forward and as high as possible. So there are various mechanisms for why this is, is beneficial. Uh, I'll come on to those in just a second, but the first thing I want to show you is, is this. This is Jonathan Edwards again. So the, the first video I showed you of Jonathan Edwards was in Atlanta in 1996. This is Jonathan Edwards uh, the previous year, 1995, breaking the world record. So in 1996, he used a, a single arm technique. This is in the year before, so just look at his arms. I'll just run that through again. So a very definite double arm technique. And that's still the world record. This is, this is 1995. So one of the oldest, one of the oldest records in the book. So he stood for 25 years now, uh, 18 meters and 29. And he did that using this, this double arm technique. So this is a quote here from, from Jonathan Edwards, suggesting that he, he adopted this technique in 1995. So he'd used a single arm technique. He adopted the double arm technique and in, radically improved his, his performance to the point where he broke the world record. Uh, he jumped a, a wind-assisted 18 metres and 43, which is just unbelievable. But the following year, and, the, and, and, and every year thereafter, he, he effectively couldn't reproduce that same technique. So he had this one amazing year where he broke the world record and he used this double-arm technique. Then he reverted back to his single-arm technique, still jumped very well, but never jumped uh, as far again. So... It would seem that the, that the elite performers use this technique, the male elite performers use this technique, um, but, oh, so, the females don't, and I'll show you a video of the, of the best ever female, female jumper in just a second. So just before then, I'll just run, the, run through the, the mechanisms for why this, uh, this, this technique is better. So essentially, if you begin with your arms behind you at touchdown and then you accelerate them downwards, that, that creates a, a reaction force on, on the shoulders which accelerates the body upwards. So effectively, it cushions the leg from the impact when the impacts are very, very high. Then subsequently, as the, the arms and, and the swinging leg swing through, um, they're then accelerated upwards. And by accelerating the muscles, uh, the, the leg um, and the arms upwards actually causes a force acting downwards on the legs. And in doing so, it, it slows the contraction velocity of, of the muscles. And we know that in, by slowing the contraction velocity concentrically in muscles, uh, that allows them to produce more force. So it allows the muscles to, to do more work by accelerating the arms, so the mass of the arms, upwards um, and producing this reaction force downwards. This then allows the ground contact to go on for longer and allows the muscles to work for longer. Um, and then at takeoff, it leads to the arms being higher, so that brings the centre of mass higher and also further forwards. So the centre of mass is higher and further forwards, and which is exactly what you want, uh, you want to be as high as possible and as, and as far forward as possible. And then the last benefit potentially is that having the arms out in front of you then allows you to, to swing them backwards in flight, which stops you from over-rotating, which you typically do when you, when you perform a jump takeoff. So there's lots of potential benefits to this technique. Um, so as I mentioned, this is, this is pretty well adopted by all elite male triple jumpers now. However, very few female triple jumpers do it. And this is a video of uh, Anessa Kravitz breaking the women's world record in the same year, actually, as Jonathan Edwards, and again, it's still the world record, um, 25 years on. So this is her jumping 15, 15 meters 50, 
and you can see that she uses the single arm technique. So there is certainly a scope, I think, for female athletes to adopt this technique. Uh, I know some are now, and I hope to see it adopted more widely, and I think it could lead to, to improvements in performance. So that's arm techniques. Um, the next thing I want to come on to is, is velocity trade-offs. So this is what happens to the velocity of the, of the center of mass during the ground contact. So in each ground contact, you effectively want to, to trade off horizontal velocity for, for vertical velocity. So just to give a bit of background on this, I just want to look at, at some of the mechanisms um, that, that lead to this trade-off in, in horizontal jump, jump takeoffs or, or any running jump takeoff. So in, in a running jump, uh, athletes generate horizontal velocity and, and momentum in an approach run. And then they attempt to uh, convert some of that horizontal velocity into vertical velocity. Now the amount they require depends on the events. Obviously in the high jump you want to, to, to maximize that vertical velocity. In the long and triple jump, you want to maximize the distance you travel. So that there's, there's an optimal trade-off. And there are really a couple of mechanisms um, that allow athletes to, to perform this trade-off. So, and I'll just, I'll just go into them. Effectively, the first one is that the, the body goes from being in the air, moving linearly, to, to rotating about the foot. Um, and the second one, is that during the ground contact, the leg actually flexes and extends. So if we think about the first one, this is, this is the only equation I'm gonna put up, so I apologize for that. Um, but it's just an, an example of how this trade-off occurs. So in the first diagram here, we've got, this is a very, very simplified model of the body. So we've got a, a rigid leg and, and the center of mass. So, this is a massless rigid leg, and this is just the center of mass. So that the, the model is moving towards the ground contact, if you like, and it's got a vertical velocity and a horizontal velocity. Now, during ground contact, because the, the force acts through the foot, or acts through the point of contact in this model anyway, the angular momentum of the body is conserved. So the body hits the ground, and then it begins to rotate about a fixed point here in a circle, in circular motion. So in the first instance, there are two things really I'd like to point out. So the two things which um, will limit how the, 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 the angular momentum after takeoff are the size of the vertical velocity and, and the plant angle here. So the further back this, this body is leaning, the smaller the angular momentum due to the horizontal velocity. So that's that's this component here. And the bigger the angular momentum component due to the, the vertical velocity. So if you want to create more vertical velocity, you, you have to potentially increase your, your plant angle. You have to lean back more. But that then does lead you to lose more um, linear momentum in the end. Uh, so it's a trade-off. You need to gain vertical velocity, but um, you only need to gain enough that, that it, it suits your purpose, which is depending on the event, either to jump as high as possible or, or as far as possible. And so that's why this velocity is traded off. That's one of the mechanisms for how the horizontal velocity becomes vertical velocity, because you end up with this vertical component. So even if you only had a horizontal component here, you would have a vertical component here as the body started to, to rotate. Um, and the amount of horizontal velocity you lose is, is dependent really on how big this plant angle is. So that's the first, the first mechanism. The second one is that in reality, we don't have a rigid leg. And actually what happens is the body hits the ground and the leg flexes and then it extends. So that extension actually allows you to generate vertical velocity, so it increases this radius, so it's a, a radial velocity. So you end up with a positive radial velocity, 
so that the, the mass is moving away from the foot and that causes a, a vertical velocity. Now, this again typically results in a loss in, in uh, kinetic energy and, and hence momentum in this case of the center of mass because there are huge impacts and during those impacts, I think on the next slide, yeah. So during those impacts, as you hit the ground, you typically will have eccentric muscle actions. Now in eccentric muscle actions, you can produce a lot of force and they're also associated with losing energy. So in a jump takeoff, you typically have a, a flexion of the limb, which is, is likely to be associated with some eccentric muscle force. And then you have uh, an extension of the limb, which is associated with concentric muscle forces. And, and during these brief ground contacts, you have a high impact, and then you don't have very long to, to kind of recoup that energy. So you tend not to recoup it, and you tend to lose, lose energy, um, lose velocity, in this case, lose momentum at the center of mass. So in each ground contact, we're losing, um, we're losing momentum. Um, and we have to trade it off this horizontal velocity for vertical velocity in order to try to maximize our performance. So I'll come back to these, these mechanisms when, uh, when we get to the results of this study. So oh, just a, an example to show how uh, effective this rotational mechanism is. So as the body hits the ground, it begins to rotate about the foot. This is a typical ground reaction force of a, of a running jump. So you get an impact peak up here and then um, you get an active peak over here. And the leg actually begins to straighten somewhere over here. So most of the vertical impulse ha has already been generated. So actually a lot of the, a lot of the vertical impulse is being generated while the leg is still bending due to this, this rotation of the, of the body about the foot. Okay, so just a little bit of background on uh, what's been done before in velocity trade-offs. So some previous studies um, on elite triple jumpers have found there's a, a, a subject specific link between the gain in vertical velocity and the loss of horizontal velocity. Um, and that, that determines the optimal ratio of, of each of the phases to the whole jump. Um, but the effect of what the initial velocity, so whether they're large or small on this is, is, is not known. So this is just a figure from, from Ewan Hay um, showing for, for different triple jumpers this relationship. So this is the gain in vertical velocity um, on the horizontal axis here. Uh, and this is the loss in horizontal velocity. So the gain in vertical velocity and the loss in horizontal velocity. And so it seems that for each individual, these are the, uh, the, the hop phase and the step and the jump phase. They're different because in the step and the jump, the subjects are coming in with large uh, vertical velocity, so they have to produce a lot more total change in vertical velocity. That is, that has to go from negative to positive to get back on off off the ground. So for each subject, there seems to be this relationship where the gain in vertical velocity is is a function, a linear function of the loss in in horizontal velocity. So we wanted to 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 try to dig into that a little bit more with with the simulation model. So I mentioned that this determines the phase ratio. So I'll just quickly uh, clarify what I mean by this. So James Hay in 1992 said this, this should take priority over all of the triple jump technical problems um, because he considered this to be the most important one. So let's just look at what we mean by phase ratio. It's quite simple. Um, it's just the ratio of each of the distances uh, expressed as a percentage of the total distance jump. So looks a bit like this. So each of the phases um, represented as a percentage of the, of the whole. So a typical phase uh, ratio might be that you'd have 35% in the hop, 30 in the step, and 35 in the jump. And that would be classed as a balanced technique. So no phase is um, more than 2% larger than the next phase. If a phase is more than 2% larger, then it becomes uh, depending on the phase, if it's the hop that's larger, it's hop dominated. If it's the jump, it's jump dominated. It doesn't tend to be step step dominated. So 
So historically, these phase ratios over the years in, in males, uh, male world record performances tend to have, have changed from having very short steps uh, in the earlier years of triple jumping. Um, and then the steps settled at somewhere towards 30%. Um, but in the 20 years between 1950 and 1970, they tended to be more hop dominated, so larger hops and smaller jumps. And then laterally, they became more jump dominated. So the hop distance or hop percentage went down and the jump percentage went up. So there's quite a lot of success in recent years by having a slightly longer jump um, jump phase. So the aim of this study really was to investigate these relationships uh, in each of the three phases using the, the computer simulation model um, to establish why these relationships were as, as they were. So, and then this also affects the phase ratio. So we wanted to see how it affected the phase ratio. Uh, and I'll come on to how we did this in just a second. Um, but what we wanted to do was to establish how changing the initial conditions might alter the, the trade-offs between the um, horizontal and the vertical velocity. So the horizontal velocity lost in order to gain vertical velocity. So the way we did this, the way we altered the initial conditions was to constrain, um, so by penalizing the model effectively, forced it to take off with different vertical velocities. So in each case, the model still tried to maximize the distance jumped. Um, so it was optimized for ma maximum distance. And based on the initial velocity from, from the measured uh, performance of the match simulation, it was increased and decreased by uh, increments of 10% 10, 10 up to 30 and minus 30%. So in each case, it was then optimized to maximize the distance jumped with this vertical velocity. Then in the step and the jump phases, the initial velocities were calculated uh, just from the takeoff phases, takeoff velocities of the previous phase, and they themselves were then optimized. Um, each was individually optimized to, to maximize the distance of the, of the phase. Okay, so this is a representation of um, three of the optimizations, one, where the vertical velocity was increased by 30%, one where it was the same as the match simulation, and one where it was decreased by 30%. So the key thing really you can see here is the difference in the initial position of the model at touchdown between the three, especially between minus 30 and plus 30. So obviously leaning back a lot further here than it is here. And we can kind of relate that back to uh, that pivot effect and the fact that when you need to generate vertical velocity, you have to start with the center of mass uh, further back, so with a bigger plant angle, as they call it. So I'll just try to play these videos through. So you can see the differences really lay mostly in the hop phase, and then the step phase, because of the, the different vertical velocities that it was landing with, um, by the jump phase, actually the techniques have become quite similar again. So onto the velocity trade-offs. So what we were expecting to see was uh, what we saw in uh, what you and Hay found was that there would be these two lines uh, and they would both have similar gradients. And we didn't find that. We saw we found the same relationship in the hop takeoff, but by the time we got to the, the step and the jump, we just didn't really see that uh, that same relationship. Um, and we were a bit flummoxed. But actually, by looking at, rather than the gain in vertical velocity, and in this case, this means um, you're having to reverse the velocity. So you come in with a negative vertical velocity and you take off with a positive one. If we plotted the loss in horizontal velocity against the takeoff velocity, uh, vertical velocity, so that's just the, the absolute takeoff, the velocity at takeoff, 
we do see that they actually all sit on the same line. Um, so if we just plot that all together, you can see there's a pretty strong relationship where if we take the vertical takeoff velocity um, and the loss in horizontal velocity, they do follow quite a nice relationship. Now, it's hard to say why this isn't what's seen in, in practice in elite performers, um, but this is based on, on a simulation model which is, is trying to optimize technique, so it's very uh, specific. There's no kind of errors in there, if you like. It can, it can, it can um, operate a technique with very small tolerances, whereas humans obviously have motor noise they have to deal with, um, and they may not be able to operate to those kind of tolerances. This was the relationship we found, and I think the next slide, I hope, should indicate potentially how, how the model managed to do this. Um, so if we go back to our pivot mechanism, so when the body hits the ground, it reorients the velocity of the center of mass from, from moving linearly to, to rotating about the foot. So in the first instance, this line's just to show, uh, really just for comparison of where the torso is. So you can see that when the model had to generate a lot more vertical velocity, it leant back a long way. Uh, when it didn't, it, it leant forward. And this then led to a high vertical velocity here. So coming into the step, it's coming down with more vertical velocity, whereas in this case, it's coming down with less vertical velocity. And we can see the opposite is true. So when it was having to deal with really high vertical velocities, and remember this, this acts against um, the positive angular momentum, the vertical velocity acts to rotate the body this way. And we want to rotate the body this way. So what we don't want is for this to be a long way away from, from the foot in this case. So what the model did was to choose to place the body over the foot when the vertical velocity was high, and it chose to place the body further behind the foot when the vertical velocity was low and it still had more horizontal velocity. And so it seemed to mitigate the effects of this vertical velocity uh, in order to, to try to, to optimize the, the effects on the performance. So onto the, the phases and the phase ratios, the, the distances actually were furthest. Now there's a big caveat here in that these phases were optimized independently. So humans will optimize their technique to maximize the total distance. Uh, in this case, in this particular optimization, and in, in, in later optimizations, um, we did optimize the entire triple jump as one optimization process, but in this one, each was optimized independently. So when the model lands here after a short hop, it will do a very long step, where it might be better served to also do a short step and a very long jump. But it's not trying to do that because it's doing them independently. So in this case, uh, the best results came here with um, a moderately increased hop phase from the, from the optimized simulation. So if we look at this in percentage terms, we get something that looks like this. So as the strength, uh, sorry, as the velocity went up, the hop, the, the step phase went down. So as it came in with bigger vertical velocities, the step phase got smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, and vice versa. So when the, when the hop uh, vertical velocity was, was low, the step phase was very large. But in most cases, uh, this didn't change the, the phase ratio too much. So we had some hop dominated techniques at the top here and some balanced techniques at the bottom. So, in short, uh, the match simulations of the model um, indicated it was, it was accurate to, to do the optimization. And the loss in the horizontal velocity related really strongly to the vertical takeoff velocity and not the total change in vertical velocity. And this might be because the model was um, reorienting the body uh, so that it didn't lose too much angular momentum at, at, at the impact, um, wherein it may be that, that, that people aren't able to do that quite so accurately. Uh, and that's why we don't see it in elite performance. The phase ratio was not particularly sensitive uh, to, the, to the length of the hop phase, and it, it was uh, either hop dominated when the vertical velocity of the hop was high, or it was balanced for all the other, the other simulations. 
So the last thing I, I want to talk to you about is um, the effects of increasing strength and, and approach velocity on performance. So the motivation for this really is that athletes train to increase both these things. They train in the gym to increase their strength by, by lifting weights, by doing plyometrics, um, and they train uh, their sprinting ability to maximize their approach velocity. It's impossible to say how each of these things interrelates because they typically uh, increase in tandem. Potentially, you can increase strength and it may improve your approach velocity. So computer simulation would allow each of these factors to, to establish how this would um, improve or how it would affect performance independently. Also, by simulating this, we get the idea of... of what optimal technique might look like for, for different athletes. So previous work has been based on a, on a subject specific model uh, is, that has a particular approach velocity and particular strength. So in order to establish optimal technique for a range of athletes, by varying this approach velocity and, and strength, it gives us um, an estimate of what optimal technique might look like for different athletes with different strengths and different, uh, different approach speeds. So the aim really was to, to alter these things and find what effect they had on, the, on both the jump distance and the phase ratios employed by these athletes. So the strength and velocity changes. The strength um, increases were made by effectively lifting the surface. So if you remember, I showed you that each of the torque generators had a surface which uh, determined how much torque it could produce at a given angle and a given angular velocity. So when we say increasing strength by 10%, this whole surface was just lifted up by 10%. Um, and that we just did this across the board for, for all of the torque generators. The velocity increases were just increasing the horizontal velocity of the, the center of mass of the model at the touchdown of the hot phase. So in the previous model uh, I showed you, each phase was, in, was uh, optimized independently. In this model, the whole triple jump is, is optimized. So this is a more realistic uh, representation of, of how the, the of, of an optimal technique for a given approach velocity and strength. And so for each combination, we just maximize the total triple jump distance and the optimal phase ratios uh, etc. just fell out of that. So, on to the results. So, across the top here, we've got improvements or increases in approach velocity. So, this is the, the measured performance here. Uh, and down the side here, we've got increases in strength. So, what we can see is that if we increase the approach velocity and the strength, by 10%, we get a rough, roughly, surprisingly, a 10% increase in performance, and 20% and 30% similarly. So it would seem if we increase both these things by the same percentage, the outcome increases by approximately that percentage. Now, that might seem obvious, but but there was no uh, there was no real way of knowing uh, that that would be the case without without optimizing it and finding it out. If we look across what the effects are of just independently increasing strength and an approach velocity that they're actually quite different so we can see we can see that across the top here if we increase approach velocity without increasing strength we actually hit a plateau uh, when the individual is running at 30 percent faster they cease to jump any further because they're effectively not strong enough to to benefit from it strength always leads to an improvement in performance uh, but nowhere near as much as a combination of strength and velocity at the same time. So this is a surface fit to that data we've just seen. Um, just to, to give an, an indication here that there is a an interrelationship of strength and velocity. So this is the this is the distance jumped, and this is strength and velocity. And you can see here there's a there's an interrelationship term 
here where improving strength and velocity actually combines to to improve the performance um there's an independent improvement of both but an additive or a multiplicative benefit of of improving strength and velocity on on performance so in terms of the phase ratios we saw roughly what we saw before really that when approach velocity and strength were increased in tandem that the model retained this hot dominated technique uh, but when these things were were altered independently it moved to a balanced technique but quite a different balanced technique in that when the approach velocity was increased without increasing strength we ended up with a balanced technique where the step phase was quite small and where we increased strength the step phase got larger and larger and larger until the three phases were almost almost the same size which we never really see in uh, in elite performance but surprisingly we didn't see any jump dominated techniques despite this being a um a technique which is used by uh some of the very best jumpers so in summary uh increasing velocity and strength both independently led to increasing performance um, but not anywhere near as much as as increasing them together now the optimal phase ratios were always either balanced or hot dominated that's surprising because we know that elite performers do also use jump dominated techniques and it may be a feature again of the model um, that there's an aspect of a jump dominated technique which not represented which is beneficial is not represented in the model and that could be um potentially due to the fact that it's easier to control it's more repeatable to use a jump dominated technique it could be because uh by reducing the impacts uh, the largest impact is typically at the landing of the uh of the hop so if that phase is smaller then that big impact is reduced so it could be that that performers choose not to do that because the impacts are, are lower and it's a safer way of of jumping um it could potentially be something to do with the the last flight phase uh we didn't optimize the flight phases and it may be that with a jump dominated technique and a longer flight phase you can do more to reorient the body and get a better landing position um which could improve performance but in terms of the the simulations it typically found that these hot dominated techniques were were beneficial so that's that's all i've got to to talk to you about today um so just to conclude uh based on all the, all the studies that i've talked about what can we conclude on on triple jumping performance and what athletes should be doing well the double arm technique it does seem that this is optimal um male jumpers use it and female jumpers some female jumpers are adopting it now but but most don't use it yet so the real change could come with with female jumpers adopting this double arm technique and that could improve improve their performance if you in terms of the, the velocity trade offs it seems that you can mitigate your losses of um horizontal velocity when vertical velocities are high if you make sure that you always orient your body over the foot at, at touchdown so you allow the, allow the leg to to absorb the impact if you like rather than to try to rotate about the foot and then lastly um strength and by increasing strength and and, and velocity we still saw that the phase ratios were, were typically always balanced and hot dominated but we see that elite performers also use jump dominated techniques uh increasing the strength and velocity obviously in in, in both cases was was beneficial uh for a triple jump or for the triple jumper in in this study um but it seems that to be an elite performer uh when you're talking 18 meter jumps you've you've got to be exceptionally strong and exceptionally fast that's no real surprise but you've really got to hit the board um at upwards of 10 and a half meters per second probably in order to to think about jumping um 
18 meters and you've also obviously got to be exceptionally strong. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please, if you do have any questions, feel free to, to get in contact with me, um, probably best via email, but you can look at my, uh, my staff page and, and give me a call if you want to. So all it remains is to say thank you uh, again to Stuart and um, sorry to miss you all at ISBS this year. I hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sam. And I know because it was pre-recorded, I've already thanked Sam personally, but I just want to take the opportunity again to, I guess, publicly say a huge thank you to Sam for that talk. And um, as I said at the start, I found it really enjoyable from both a theoretical biomechanics perspective, but also because of the practical implications from a sporting perspective. So thanks, Sam. And as Sam said, um, feel free to either get in touch via email or leave a comment below and we can get an answer to any questions you might have that way if you prefer. But that said, I'm really happy to put up on screen now the lectures for the next five weeks, which at least for now will be the final block of lectures in this series. So starting next week, we've got Wendy Holiday talking about cycling biomechanics, and then John Drazan um, talking about how we can use biomechanics as a vehicle, I guess, for STEM outreach to engage youth in biomechanics. Then the next few are really, I guess, by popular demand, a few people requested a talk on Bayesian statistics following Kristen Sinani's excellent statistics talk a few weeks back. So Tony Myers has offered to deliver just that. And then back by popular demand, we've got Kristen Sinani again, but this time um, providing some tips for scientific writing. And then finally, to finish off, I'm really delighted to have a talk by Walter Herzog on muscle mechanics. So thank you very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed that and hopefully see you soon.